I'm Shankar Singham with the um, uh, Economic Policy uh, Studies Group at the Legaltan Institute, uh, the Director of Economic Policy and Prosperity Studies. I'm here with Professor Razin Sally, who is the, um, a professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Government um, at the National University of Singapore and the chairman of a um, public policy think tank um, in Sri Lanka, which is um, advising the Sri Lankan government on economic policy issues. And Razin, you, you very kindly came in and did a pr presentation with us here at the, at the Institute. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions um, about your, your, your ideas and presentation, particularly in the context of the paper and the studies that we are doing on, on 21st century trade policy tools. Um, our, um, our work is suggesting that actually there is a huge amount of economic activity that could be unlocked mm -hmm. if countries move, you know, first of all, continue to lower trade, traditional trade barriers and trade tariffs and so on, but also move to deal with structural reform issues. Um, and I'd like you to reflect a little bit on, on how countries can actually um, it, deal with these structural reform issues which are if solved, could lead to huge amounts of economic activity uh, and innovation. Hmm. Um, yes, as, as you said, Shankar, that's, that's, a, that's a huge agenda. Um, uh, we have seen progress in the last few decades on traditional barriers to trade uh, and foreign investment to some extent. Uh, but uh, the biggest barriers by far now in the West and outside the West are much more complicated non-tariff regulatory barriers and the political obstacles to dislodging them uh, are proving to be much bigger, uh, more intractable than the traditional trade, trade barriers. Uh, but the prize is huge. Uh, the issue I think is very much uh, one of competition. Uh, so competition remains repressed. Uh, and that relates to international trade and investment uh, as well. Uh, when competition is repressed, uh, innovation is repressed, uh, jobs aren't created, productivity levels remain low, and crucially, it affects uh, inequality as well, because what all of this does is entrench the positions of inside elites who are comfortable with their rents uh, and who are not exposed to competition from outsiders, including startups, SMEs, and, and, and so on. So how, how do we tackle all of that? Um, I think the answer is to look at it bottom up rather than top down. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the illusion that this enormous complicated agenda can be tackled in the first instance through uh, ambitious international agreements um, or even regional integration. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not the case because a lot of this is very local, national and context specific. Um, and the politics of this tends to be very local, national and context specific. So it's got to start at home. Mm -hmm. I'm very fond of uh, uh, an adage of uh, uh, a defunct German economist that internationalism like charity begins at home mm -hmm. and that you don't build a house starting with the roof. Mm -hmm. Of course, the foundations must come first. Right. So doing things nationally, autonomously, unilaterally to tackle both trade barriers as well as those domestic barriers in services markets, uh, standards protectionism, public procurement, subsidies, state-owned enterprises, digital economy stuff, and so on. All of that has got to start at home, uh, and not least to attract productive trade and foreign investment, and then be imitated by other countries when they see that one country is being successful. That's the traditional way it's happened, and I think there's still a lot of mileage for it to happen that way in the future. But of course, it, it's not going to happen just that way on its own. Um, so a lot of these traditional trade as well as crony capitalist issues uh, require some level of international cooperation. Mm. Uh, so in the second instance, as a helpful auxiliary, mm. Mm. we should be looking at things like uh, serious free trade agreements, uh, what some people call deep integration free mm -hmm. trade agreements, um, 
and also at the WTO. Mm -hmm. uh, the WTO is a problem because negotiations have been stuck for ever so long. Uh, it needs to be unblocked. The multilateral system is important. Uh, but uh, these days it's perhaps politically more relevant to think of uh, getting together with like-minded countries uh, that are capable and willing not just to tackle traditional border barriers, but some of this deep integration, mm. structural reform agenda as, as well. And the agreements that come to mind that are on the table being negotiated or have already been mm -hmm. negotiated are uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, mm -hmm. uh, which across Asia Pacific, which covers about 40% of world GDP, uh, uh, which is the biggest trade deal in 20 years, and the transatlantic uh, uh, negotiation between the Americans and the EU, stuck at the moment, but also ambitious, at least in content. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think these are the ways to, to go. Um, I would add one, one final point. Um, probably the best prospects for doing some of these serious reform experiments, uh, again thinking bottom up, uh, are not actually what you do at the international or regional level or perhaps even at the national level. It's what you do at the subnational level. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where the whole agenda of urbanization and mm. cities mm. comes into play. Mm. Because I think experience has taught us that the most successful reform experiments are those that are done down below mm -hmm. at closest proximity to the citizen. Right. Um, and uh, doing these experiments in in cities and other governance zones, if you will, um, and having those successes emulated mm. elsewhere within the country and abroad. Creating demonstration models. Yes, yes. Uh, mm. is something we should be thinking much more mm. seriously about. Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, we have two um, uh, programs at, at the Legatum Institute. One is um, uh, we've advocated for a prosperity zone which would be that deeper integration um, agreement across like-minded countries that believe in open trade and competition on the merits and property rights protection. But the other is this program of enterprise cities which mm. are zones that as you described would be would have would have better governance systems across again those three uh, dimensions and so it would seem that working at both those levels Mm. may be possible to to deal with this sort of somewhat intractable problem of of, of crony crony capitalism um, one of the comments that you made um, today was um, that we're seeing a, a fair amount of Adam Smith um, but we're not seeing a lot of Joseph Schumpeter that in other yes. words we're not seeing a lot of create the creative destruction that leads to innovation and and some of this is linked to the lack of competition and the mm. lack of uh, and consequently the lack of innovation um, I'd ask you to sort of reflect a little bit on, on what the future could look like. So, so assuming that we um, were able to make progress in, in some of these areas, um, Robert Gordon uh, has written a book essentially saying that we've exhausted mm. all, all the innovation. Christine Lagarde has talked about the new normal of yes. a very, very limited economic growth in the world. Do you agree with that? Or do you think there's actually something else that, 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 is, you know, that we're capable of achieving as, as human beings? Yes. No, I mean, I, I would disagree with uh, what, what seems to be conventional mm. wisdom today, uh, which, is, which revolves around innovation pessimism. Um, and innovation pessimism almost invariably leads to calls for governments to be more interventionist mm. uh, in terms of slicing up the pie, right. the economic pie, um, as a means of redressing inequality and other, other social ills. Uh, I, I remain an optimist, not least based on my reading of history for what it's worth, uh, namely that if the system is open enough, mm -hmm. uh, new inventions will be turned into innovations mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of being marketable, creating new products and services, creating new, more dynamic, productive uh, jobs as well and improving life chances mm -hmm. for an increasing number of people around the world. Um, 
to do that, as Schumpeter said, uh, the system needs to be open enough to these swarms of new entrepreneurs who come in, mm -hmm. uh, swarm around new technologies, and unleash these gales of creative destruction, right. which dislodge mm -hmm. the old settled sclerotic elite. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the way material progress, and with it social progress, has happened in the West. Uh, in the past. Now, um, the problem is that in recent decades, uh, this process has slowed down. Mm. So, yes, we have new gadgets, yeah. but the gadgets have not led to the kind of innovation right. that we've seen in the past. That's, that's one of Robert Gordon's essential theses. Mm. Um, but where I would disagree with his overall thesis is that I think there's still huge potential in the future uh, for this kind of innovation to happen with the new technologies that are emerging. But the crucial proviso is that our systems need to be made much more open mm. uh, to competition, essentially. Uh, and that requires governments removing bottlenecks, governments removing privileges from uh, established elites, including big multinationals. Um, uh, so that creative destruction can take place. If that happens, there will be a supply side effect with much more investment in infrastructure for these new technologies. And there will be new services and new jobs created, which we can't define at the moment by definition because they're in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I think all of that is possible. Uh, we have sclerosis in the West that prevents it from happening. And I see an even bigger problem outside the West. So for all the mm. talk of the rise of the rest, and of Asia in particular, uh, the, the reality is that capitalism in these parts of the world still remains very imitative. It's about catching up with the West mm. by imitating what the West has already done, mm. rather than creative destruction. Yep. Now, that's OK if you're poor mm. and still catching up. But if you've exhausted catch-up potential or come close to the frontier, as it mm -hmm. were, uh, and are middle income or high income, uh, you need to innovate. Mm -hmm. And the problem, uh, not, not least with the high income economies of, of East Asia, is that they're not innovating sufficiently. They're stuck in low productivity traps uh, because their systems are, are, to, are closed are not open enough. Now, that wasn't a problem when they were catching up right. so much, but it's a problem now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it requires a rethink, not just of policies, but of the, the enveloping framework of institutions, including political systems. So that's a roundabout answer to your original mm -hmm. question, what does the future look like? Mm -hmm. Well, if, if systems are made more open, and we have to think mm -hmm. of political ways of making them more open, mm -hmm. Uh, then the future is more liberal. Excellent. Well, thank you, um, Rosine, for, for coming in today. We've very much enjoyed having you and we welcome you back to the Legotum Institute when, when, uh, as soon as your schedule permits. Thank you. Thank you.